on this 23rd Sunday after Pentecost is from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Brethren, be imitators of me and mark those who walk after the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is their ruin, their God is the belly. Their glory is in their shame. They mind the things of earth. But our citizenship is in heaven, for which also we eagerly await a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who will refashion the body of our lowliness, conforming it to the body of his glory by exerting the power by which he is also able to subject all things to himself. So then, my brethren, beloved and longed for, my joy and my crown, Stand fast thus in the Lord, beloved. I entreat Evodia and I exhort Syntyche to be of one mind in the Lord. And I beseech thee also, my loyal comrade, help them, for they have toiled with me in the gospel, as have Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. <clears> At <throat> that time as Jesus was speaking to the crowds, behold, a ruler came up and worshipped him, saying, Lord, my daughter has just now died, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she will return to life. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Now a woman who for 12 years had been suffering from hemorrhage came up behind him and touched the tassel of his cloak, saying to herself, If I touch but his cloak, I shall be saved. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Take courage, daughter, thy faith has saved thee. And the woman was restored to health from that moment. When Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players in the crowd making a den, he said, Behold, the girl is asleep, not dead. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the crowd had been put out, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this spread throughout all the district. So the words of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. <clears throat> the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this uh, Mass is offered for a special intention. And Paul's letter to the Philippians, he's making a point that Christians are, we're aliens. Did you know that? We're not from Mars or anywhere, but we are aliens. We are sojourners, exiles in this world. Where do we belong? We are citizens. We are citizens of heaven. We belong to Christ, not to governments, and not even to earthly homelands. Christians' minds must be fixed on heavenly things. Earthly things can be equal, either our tools to work out through our salvation or they can be obstacles. Senior Boylan says a true Christian spirit is described uh, readiness to do and suffer all things rather than fail in loyalty to the homeland that is the homeland of heaven, end quote. So he lists a few things. First off, concentration on the things of God. How often during the day do we really pause and think about what does God want for me? What does God want for my family or my neighbors or, or other people I know? And uh, I mean, beyond 
salvation, obviously, there are things that are more immediate, perhaps. Secondly, control of our passions. We all know about that one. We have to control our passions to keep the uh, obstacles of selfishness, obstacles of ourselves out of the way. Setting aside of all that is lustful, unclean, and worldly. Fourthly, charity for all. Uh, fifthly, frequent reception of the sacraments. Sixthly, constant prayer. And seven, a permanent sense of union with God, sometimes called the practice of the presence of God. We need to be working on all these things. These things are our, job, our primary job description for every day that we live and breathe. St. Paul then contrasts that with what he calls a sensuous way of living that makes people enemies of the cross. Notice he says enemies of the cross. If you're an enemy of the cross, you're an enemy of Christ. You're letting him down in some way. Father Gabriel describes it this way. Every time that we shun a sacrifice, that we protest against suffering, that we seek selfish pleasures, we behave in practice like enemies of the cross of Christ. Thus our lives become too earthly, too much attached to creatures, too heavenly burdened to rise towards heaven. We must be converted we must practice detachment and remember that our conversation is in heaven. To this end, we must willingly embrace the hardships of the return journey to our heavenly homeland." End quote. In the Gospel, we see that one of the ways of being too earthly or worldly comes out in the way the Jewish ceremonial laws were practiced or observe during Christ time. The laws in particular on the ritual impurity which seem to have been treated as an ultimate priority rather than tools in order to help people along in holiness. The original intentions of these, uh, these rules on ritual impurity or uncleanness was to separate the profane from the sacred. Certain things that you don't, you don't want to come into mass, for instance, uh, with auto grease all over your hands and that kind of thing. You try to wash it off before you come. There are certain things that uh, were seen really by all the cultures of those times. The Jews sort of picked it up from the environment of those times. Um, not as a pagan thing, of course, but uh, what was clean and unclean, and sometimes it was even a little bit arbitrary. Didn't allow room for if you accidentally stepped on a, in a, uh, a tomb of somebody and all. Uh, if you did it, you know, it's like a traffic ticket. If you did it, you're guilty, and that's that. You're impure, and you have to go through all, this, all these uh, ceremonies of washing to be made pure again. So the synagogue official uh, asked Jesus to do something that would sure fire put him into ritual impurity under the Jewish laws. That is to lay his hand. It doesn't say just come heal her or raise her up. He says lay your hand upon her and she will live. Well laying your hand on a dead body uh, makes you ritually impure. So he asked him to do that, and the woman uh, with the bleeding malady was unclean herself according to uh, Jewish law, and she touches Jesus' tassel, which means under the law, that would have made Jesus too unclean. Uh, by the way, there's a le uh, neat legend about that woman is that she was Veronica. If you remember the name from the way of the cross, uh, she would later come and uh, put her uh, 
her veil on Jesus' face as he was carrying his cross. So uh, there's some archaeological evidence to that effect. So both encounters show us two things. Jesus is showing two things. First off, God's law of mercy will always overrule even good human rules that were set up by people to, uh, for the common good. So God's law is going to overrule uh, the civil uh, rule that got put up during the pandemic that people couldn't visit their relatives in the hospital or couldn't visit or visit them in the nursing homes even if they were dying uh, because they might spread germs. We know that most of that is malarkey now in hindsight, but uh, these are rules that at least technically we could have violated. Um, but that's the difference again between authority and power. Authority says we could violate those rules. Power says you go to jail if you do it. So there we are. Um, so second thing it shows us is that Jesus is God. He cannot become unclean. Rather his divinity overpowers every evil and every form of uncleanness to transform uh, one to the soundness of the true needs that each person has. Another lesson too is both the official and the woman evidently believed Jesus could bring healing and restore life. Given, gra given the grace to believe, they responded uh, to the prior grace of approaching him uh, with humility and confidence. Those are the keys to winning action from God. Humility and confidence may not be the action we want, but nonetheless, uh, humility and confidence that God will work through Jesus Christ, through the sacraments and through the sacramentals, and through us when we're in a state of grace. One of the true needs of each person is how we should approach death. How we should approach death. Senior Boylan says that Christ taught us to f not to fear death, but to watch for its coming. We call it our final end in this world. And to be ready to receive it. Death, he says, is not the end of hoping, but the gate of hope. Now, there are two kinds of death. They're, they're uh, one that's dealt with primarily here, so far as the text goes, is the death of the body. Body uh, deteriorates because it's no longer held by grace that was thrown away by original sin. It deteriorates to where it can no longer support the soul. When that separation comes, that is what we call death. And so the body is, uh, we see that post death of the body postponed in the gospel for both the woman and uh, for, the, uh, for the child. Jesus says the child is sleeping because the death of the body is like a sleep in the sense that there will eventually be an awakening. And that, of course, we know comes on the last day at the general judgment. Is also the death of the soul, which is much more to be feared. They are dead who have fallen under the sway of sin. Unlike bodies, which will share our fate whichever way we end up, they will die uh, for all of us, whether we're saints or sinners, uh, but we will get them back. By contrast, the death of the soul can be permanent, can be eternal. We're called in this life to ask uh, our resurrection from God from the death of sin to a life of grace, from a lukewarm life to a fervent and holy life. Uh, Monsignor Boylan says we're given but little time to make ourselves ready for eternity. 
Let us remember that such time as is spent in the death of sin is lost forever. We can't go back and make up that time. We can't go back and earn the merit to cancel the sin out. Which basically means if we fall in a serious way into sin, we need to hustle our bustle to the confessional uh, as fast as we can. We're more fortunate than a woman with a bleeding ailment. She only touched Jesus once for healing. But we can have penance and Holy Communion frequently throughout our lives. And I don't mean come searching for the priest to hear a confession over nothing every single day. Don't wear us out. If you've got no priest, you've got no confessions, right? <laughs> but, uh, but we have these things and we should appreciate them. They are our lifelines that our Lord has given us. and We should appreciate them as that. St. Irenaeus finally, I love quoting this line, he says, the glory of God is man fully alive. Man fully alive is the glory of God. That's what we're seeking. Real life, the fullness of life in Christ. May God bless you. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.